Would you like to learn how to master the technical part of the Cloud Architect interview? Well, if so, this video is for you. Hi, my name is Michael Gibbs, and I've been working in technology for over 25 years. I've worked in networking, I've worked in security, and I've worked in cloud computing, and I've been teaching, coaching, or mentoring others for well over 20 years. Today, we're going to be talking about how to master the technical component of the Cloud Architect interview. See, as hiring managers, it's up to us to find strong, capable individuals that can competently perform the job and improve the quality of our team. And how we gauge competency is not based upon the number of years experience you have, that's not based on the number of certifications you have, but it's gonna be based upon the technical interview. Now, there's a lot of things we learn from this technical interview. It is not just your technical capabilities. We learn your level of competency. To a certain degree, we can gauge your soft skills. We can check your emotional intelligence and the way you respond to these. We can check your communication skills and we can even check your sales skills because you're effectively going to be selling yourself to the hiring manager. So we learn a lot in this interview. So the best way to do this and the best way we gauge it is by asking open-ended cloud architect interview questions. The reason they're open-ended is we're not looking for a multiple choice answer. That doesn't tell us anything. Anyone can basically memorize that this does this. But as an architect, we need to be able to interact with customers, ask the right questions, look at the customer's business, legal, technical, and regulatory requirements, and then design a solution. So we're gonna to have to ask these open-ended questions. So as I mentioned in the last video, we're going to have a video every week for the next eight weeks, and we're gonna give you 50 of the most common best Cloud Architect interview questions that we've seen. So the first question we're going to ask people is how do you secure a VPC? And the reason we ask this question is we wanna know if someone truly understands security or if they've learned just a security term. See, when I ask the question and someone says, use a knuckle in a security group, I know they've read a book or passed an exam, but I know they don't understand security. If someone says to me, you secure your VPC in layers, use a firewall at the edge of your network to keep a strong perimeter and keep outsiders out, Behind the firewall, use an IDS, IBS, IPS system to see what's going on if there's an intrusion, and if so, thwart the intrusion as it occurs. Use some DDoS protection outside of your domain. And then inside of your domain, keep unwanted traffic out of your subnets with a network ACL. Keep unwanted traffic out of your servers with a security group. Better yet, add a host-based firewall to your security group. Then you're going to add components such as IAM, then you're gonna provide components such as locking down your systems to make sure they don't have any unnecessary services and patching for vulnerabilities, and it goes on and goes on and goes on. When I hear that from a candidate, I know they understand security. When I just hear one or two service names, I know they've passed an exam. So when you're on these interviews, it is up to you to show that you're competent. So show them, show some depth of knowledge so that you understand it and you'll always be hired because it's very hard to find qualified people that can answer questions like this. Now, the next kind of thing that I ask people, and I've seen asked a lot, is an organization wants to use cloud as a disaster recovery site. And then I went, and they would say, what are the options, and what are the strengths and weaknesses of each option? See, this gives us good information about the person's architectural abilities. There really are four options with regards to using the cloud for disaster recovery. And each one of these has strengths and weaknesses, and I wanna know if the potential employee knows. If they tell me that you have basically four options for using the cloud as disaster recovery, option one is a completely cold standby where basically you put machine images of your servers in the remote location and basically you periodically send your data there to the remote location. I know that's the first type. And then they can say the advantage of this is that it's super cheap, but the disadvantage is it's going to take a long time to come back to service should you have a primary failure. Then they could say the next type is something that's a little better. For example, you make machine images of, say, your web layer and your application layer, but you keep a standby database that's active and receiving the information to be synchronized. And they could say, the advantage of that is you still have a slow failover, but it's much faster because your data is always up to date. And I could say, okay, they get it. And then if they tell me the third option is to basically replicate your environment, but use very small instances in the disaster recovery site, but basically place them in an auto scaling group, 
That tells me that they've thought of all the ways an architect can do things. And basically you could use an auto scaling group. And by using an auto scaling group, basically if their primary site fails, all the traffic through DNS will be shifted to your disaster recovery site and the systems will scale out and you'll have more computing performance. And if they know that, I know that's good. But I also want them to say, when you use this approach, it might take 10 to 30 minutes for your systems to auto scale so it's not the fastest. And then I also want my potential cloud architect to say, your fourth option is this. You can just run a standby everything, a complete hot standby. So whatever you have in one location, you have in the other location. And the only time it'll take is for DNS to detect one site down and it will reroute your traffic to the other one. That's how I know that someone's an architect and that's how I know someone can design systems. See, these open-ended questions give us so much information. The next question I like to ask people, but it's commonly asked, is when should you use a direct connection and when should you use a VPN? Why do I ask this question? This question gives us an indication if someone understands networking, or at least components of networking. See, we know that from a networking world and a performance world, if you create effectively a wire between two locations, and a direct connection is not exactly a wire, but logically it's a wire between two locations, your latency is going to be consistent and you're going to be guaranteed to have the performance of that entire wire. And if an organization needs guaranteed bandwidth and guaranteed consistent latency, they must use a direct connection. Now, for example, if the client or the candidate were to tell us something different that use a direct connection just for performance, but they couldn't explain why the performance, again, I know they've passed an exam, but I know they don't understand the concepts. I would then expect them to say, you use VPN when you want to create, make it easy to create one connection to multiple sites because the internet's there. You use the VPN because it's cheaper and because you've got the flexibility of the VPN and everybody for the most part has internet access, you can create connections on demand and it's very easy to connect to multiple remote locations. The downside is you're dependent upon internet bandwidth. And when I hear that, I know the person understands the VPN concept and the direct connect concept. So I know they understand a small component of the networking component of being a cloud architect, but even that is great because it's showing me depth of knowledge. Now, another question I like to ask, and I like to ask a lot of networking questions, and today we're predominantly talking about networking questions, but the next time we'll talk about databases or computer or something else, is I like to ask people, you've got a site that has 10 remote campuses. The main site is hosted in the cloud and they have 10 remote sites. And not only the 10 remote sites need to talk to the cloud, but they need to talk to each other. How could you do this? What are your architectural approaches? Why? Because it's going to teach me if the person understands cloud networking. See, there's three approaches and each one of them has their strengths. They could create VPN connections between the, 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 the cloud and each remote site, and that would work perfectly. Or they could basically set up VPC pairing and they can all pair with each other. So if everybody needs to connect to everybody, you're gonna to have to fully mesh your VPC pairs. And when you do that, there's advantages to that. Since everyone has a connection to everyone, should something happen in the central place, everybody can still talk to everybody else that they need to. So there's still a lot of benefits to be gained by fully meshed. Plus when you're fully meshed, your performance is better because you're never more than one hop away. The downside of fully meshed is when you're fully meshed, you will have an incredible number of peers and they, uh, and they add up rapidly because the number of peers increases dramatically. So the formula to determine the peers is n times n minus one divided by two. So if you've got three um, VPCs that need to pair with each other, it's no big deal. You have three times three minus one, which is two, which is six divided by two, which is three. Now let's say you have 10 locations in this example. You have 10 times 10 minus one, which is nine. So that means you've got 90 divided by two, which is 45. So you can see just by going from three to 10 locations, the number of connections just really went up. So that is the disadvantage. So the options they have are VPNs, they have fully meshing your peers, and they have Cloud Hub. And what Cloud Hub is a way to basically create a hub and spoke VPN connection, at least in the AWS environment, and allow for the organizations to still talk to each other through the hub and spoke, just like a traditional environment. So I want to know that the potential employee the candidate that can actually understand the how and the why, why we use it. And the last networking question that I tend to ask is typically about IPsec. And the reason I ask about IPsec is people know that it's encryption. But if they really understand IPsec, they're gonna understand all the amazing things that IPsec does beyond just encryption. So I typically ask what functions are achieved by IPsec. And if the person says encryption, 
Again, I know they've probably passed a certification exam, which is still good, but I, I know they don't really understand it. Now, if they say that IPsec provides the ability to authenticate each remote, look, remote end to prevent man in the middle attacks where someone presents, presents to be someone else, and that it can ensure the integrity of your data because it uses a hashing algorithm. And since you know your data, there's data integrity, if you've got a message going from point A to point B, someone can send someone a, a, an electronic payment for $100 and have it changed to a million dollars because you can verify that nothing's been changed. The last thing that comes out of IPsec is something called non-repudiation. Effectively, there's a record of the message. So if this person orders something from this person and then receives it, this person can't say after the fact, I didn't order it because that's the non-repudiation. So with IPsec, you, get, you have the ability to authenticate, you have the ability to determine message integrity, and you have the ability to verify that messages were, are sent and promote, provide a non-repudiation environment. In addition to the encryption, in addition to the ability to tunnel private IP addresses and private traffic and private routing information over a public network. So these are the kind of ways that I can actually gauge what people know. And today we covered five questions. Next week, we'll cover five more questions at least. They'll be in a different part of the cloud. This week, we focused heavily on the network, but the network is part of the cloud. Just remember, the cloud is nothing more than a virtualized network and a virtualized data center. Let me tell you some free offerings that we offer to the cloud architect community. Every Monday and Thursday, we have a free how to get your first cloud architect job webinar. We will talk about what employers desire, how to build a perfect resume, how to get your name out there, how to get hired, and things to do on your interview. So we do that on Monday and Thursday. They're completely free. Not only would it present in the beginning and then afterwards you can ask any questions you want and we will even help build you a career plan live on these free calls. Every Tuesday, we have a webinar about how you can get actual cloud architect experience when you're home to help you get hired because employers desire experience. The reason they desire experience is they're looking for competency so that there's a way to build real cloud architect competency at home. And we talk about that free every Tuesday at 9 a.m. I want to let you know about something that we are really excited to offer for free to the Cloud Architect community. We have just released our AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate Training, completely free. The complete online course is posted here now on our YouTube channel. We did this because we know that sometimes a certification is the first step to helping someone achieve the job and goal of their dreams. And we know there are so many people out there that really could benefit from a certification, but the cost of a quality course is beyond their budget and we wanna make it easy on them. So we have a free AWS Certified Solution Architect eBook. Um, the link is in the description below. Please fill that out. You'll get a book emailed to you. And we have a free AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate course. Use the book, use the course. That's everything you need to pass the AWS certification of the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate exam. And it's completely free compliments of Go Cloud Architects. I'd like to thank you so much for watching this video and I look forward to seeing you in another video very soon. Take care and it's so nice to speak with you today.